As we were worshiping, I was thinking back to the first time that Cheryl and I went to the Galilee and uh, how it struck me as such a, a peaceful place. We're going to join Jesus there tonight, Matthew chapter 3 and 4, as we go through our study. But I remember from the point that we landed in Tel Aviv to uh, being taken over to our hotel there in Tel Aviv and, and seeing the busyness and the hustle and bustle and, and the reality that Tel Aviv is, is a lot like uh, boy, some of our seaside towns. Very busy, very active, uh, in many ways very carnal. And then to get on the tour bus and go from there and head up to Caesarea by the sea, which is really a testimony to the brilliance of Herod and uh, monumental uh, work of his and thinking about what Rome did and, and just there are some impressive things there. But then to get back on that bus and eventually make our way on up to the kibbutz where we stayed, which was just outside of Magdala where Mary Magdalene lived and to come into the first time as we came around the road with Mount Arbel on the right side and, and the grass was green as, as I, I just never imagined it being that green but to come around the highway and to see the Sea of Galilee laid out before us and it struck me that if anyone has a right to call us to walk with him in peace it's Jesus because his boyhood and his ministry and all of that was in a place that in and of itself is just remarkably peaceful by comparison to other places. I want to invite you to go there tonight. In fact, what I want to invite you to do as we continue to read through and study through Matthew is to set aside the, the mentality of the, of the college student to take off the thinking cap and to put on the relationship hat and just walk with Jesus. I think the thing that's excited me most about reading through the Gospel of Matthew together is that we just get to be with Jesus. And I invite you to do that tonight. So I'm going to give you some technical things and some interesting side notes and some Hebrew words, Greek words here and there. But, but your primary purpose tonight, if I can offer it to you, is to walk with Jesus. Would you like to do that? <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's invite him one more time to come and walk. Lord Jesus, we are excited to be here because we know you're here. And we're excited to be in your word just because of the pictures and, and the, the, uh, Father, the point, portraits that it opens up for us. And we pray, Lord, tonight that your word, by the power of your spirit, will be a portal for us into another place, a place where, where we are just with you where we can rest and we can set aside all of the craziness, the, the Tel Aviv worries of the world and, the, and the, the big-minded Caesareas of our lives. And we can set all that aside for the quiet slopes of the Galilee, where we can just take our shoes off, Lord, and walk with you and listen to the resonance, Jesus, in your voice and, and peer into the depth of your eyes, and just to be with you, Lord, that, that's our greatest desire. We cannot wait until it's all said and done when we are just at your feet, listening and, and peering at you and worshiping. And I pray just for a little taste of that tonight as we continue on. Holy Spirit, be our guide through this time. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, We speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Tonight as we go on in Matthew's Gospel, it's preparation time. And I think the one thing that stood out to me the most, and I, and I hope you see this as we go through in these couple of chapters, is how much preparation went into the presentation of Jesus as he begins his public ministry. How much the Lord did to ready not only planet Earth, past and present and future, 
But the region in which Jesus was going to be born, how much he did to, to ready the people and ready the place and to prepare everything that needed to be prepared for Jesus to come on the scene. As we enter these pre-ministry days of Jesus, the Lord rolls out the red carpet for the king. He prepares the path, and he does it first through one of the last of the Old Testament, actually the last of what we can call the Old Testament prophets, and that's John the Baptist. Chapter 3, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar and all of his glory in Rome, A.D. 26, by our best calculation, when John the Baptist, this last of the Old Testament prophets, came on the scene. You might say, well, what do you mean the last of the Old Testament prophets? John's written about in the New Testament. Yeah, but he's the last one prior to the crucifixion of Jesus. John is the last prophet to prophesy of the Messiah. As many prophets did before him, the last probably being Malachi about 400 years before John the Baptist, now he comes on the scene. And for the first time in 400 years of silence, the voice is speaking again. The Lord is speaking through a man and he is saying, the time is now. John is truly the last Old Testament prophet. He is not a prophet in the church. He is a prophet in and to Israel. In John chapter 3, verse 29, he himself said, John the Baptist said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. He says, But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. When John says that, he is alluding to the bride being the church. The bride is the church. Obviously, then the bridegroom is Jesus. So where's John in the scenario? He's the friend of the bridegroom. He's not the bride. He's not part of the church. John's salvation is not tied into that because John actually dies before the crucifixion. John is under Jewish law. John is a part of Old Testament and of of Hebrew law. And so as he speaks, he speaks as the friend of the bridegroom. And he says, because of this, as the friend of the bridegroom, man, I am so excited. Why would John be so excited? Because John is among an elite group of prophets. Those who would prophesy about the coming of Messiah, but of all those prophets, he's the only one that would both prophesy about Jesus coming and see Jesus coming. What a fantastic privilege. All the other prophets would would miss out on actually being there at the time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 tells us the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And you can just imagine guys like Isaiah who are, who are offering these fantastic, amazing prophecies of Messiah and they're looking around and going, could this be anybody around me today? And not seeing anyone who fit the bill. But going on and trusting the Lord that what he was telling them to say was true. And yet John comes along and he gets to see that whom he prophesied about. Now Matthew tells us nothing about the birth of John the Baptist. Luke will fill in those details for us, so we'll wait until we get to that gospel. But Matthew's intention here, again, is not a biographical sketch. It's to clearly identify John as the prophet referred to by the prophet Isaiah 700 years earlier, who said, we see in verse 3, this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, who said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And as he did throughout chapters 1 and 2, Matthew now appeals again to Hebrew prophecy. He will do this throughout, throughout his his letter, his writing. He recalls Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. But Isaiah was not the only one to mention a forerunner. Isaiah was not the only one to say, God is going to send someone to prepare the way. Malachi did too. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Where the Lord said through the prophet, Behold, I am going to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Jesus later ascribed this verse himself. He ascribed it from Malachi to John, saying the following in Matthew 11, verse 7. Jesus said, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed, dressed in, in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. 
I tell you, the, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And that is the role of John. He is the one who prepares. Sent by God to prepare the people because God is never caught unprepared. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now, it, people, you know, they love to talk about this whole locust thing. Was it that John walked around with, with little, you know, insect legs sticking out of his teeth from his last snack? You know, was that it? Or, or maybe, no, it, it, people try and, and just describe it away, saying it was those little carob pods off the locust tree, kind of the, the uh, old version of raisins, you know. Did he have a little box of sun-made carob pods, or was he actually munching on fried locusts? We don't know. But we do know this. John was a prophet devoted to the Lord. And his devotion to the Lord was such that it's very likely, it's highly likely, he was a Nazarite. And we talked about that back when we studied uh, Samson in the book of Judges, and also going back before that in Numbers, where the Nazarite vow is described. A Nazarite being a man who came along and who could not cut his hair, and a man who could not drink, and a man who could not touch dead things, who would make a covenant to God to live completely devotedly to him. And I believe that's what we see in John. We certainly see the devotion. But the action, the attitude, and even the things he eats and the way he lives describe a man who says, I'm not going to have anything to do with the modern conveniences. I am devoting myself wholly and completely to the Lord. And so he did that, both for his provision and his sustenance, which is why he ate locusts. Again, what kind of locusts? Who really cares? It was out in the desert, and he's picking it or grabbing it and eating it. And God is providing it for him. Matthew 11:18. <clears throat> Jesus said, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. And then he said, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and say I'm a glutton and a drunkard. So what's the deal? <laughs> You're just trying to pick on whatever is unusual here. Well, John was a man with complete devotion to God. And verse 5 says, Then Jerusalem was going out to him. And all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan, he is kicking up some dust. Verse 6 says, They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Now, we talked about John's baptism a little bit, or at least baptism on Sunday. You need to understand there's a difference between John's baptism and the baptism that happened after Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. John's baptism is not a baptism of forgiveness. As people went out to him, they were not going out to be cleansed of their sin. They were going out to proclaim their sin. They were going out to say, I am, I, I am a, a, a lost person. I am a sinful person. I don't have what it takes. And I put myself completely at the mercy of the Lord. That was John's baptism. It was symbolic preparation for the one who would actually bring an immersion of forgiveness. Even John said that himself, John 129. The Apostle John wrote about John the Baptist that the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In other words, not my baptism. This doesn't take away your sin. But that man, that man does. And that man, of course, was Jesus. John's ministry then, again, was all about preparation. Getting people ready for Jesus. And I was thinking, I wonder if that's your ministry. I wonder if that's my ministry. You may not feel like you're a great evangelist. You might not feel like you're the kind of person who can really get down and go verse by verse and, and teach someone the Bible. You may not feel like you're someone who can stand up and be a great worship leader. But you can, like John the Baptist, prepare someone for Jesus. How do I go about doing that? Tell you what, you follow him. You plant seeds just based on your life, your behavior, your decisions, what you do. And that may be what God uses to prepare someone else for Jesus. How I walk as a Christian, and hear me on this gang, how I walk as a Christian is as much about the message as it is about the maturation. Sometimes we get so focused on ourselves and how we're maturing in Christ. Oh boy, this week was a better week than last week. Yeah, I'm really digging into the Word now. Yeah, I've really grown this year. Sometimes it's not about your personal growth at all as much as the saving of another life. And how often do we say or do we pray, Lord, it's been a good week and I hope that people have seen my good works and glorify my Father who's in heaven. Because that's what it's about. 
the lives we live, and then that might also put a little different spin on the way we behave, on the way we live, when we realize it's not just about me being a better Christian today than I was yesterday, but it's about what I do having an impact on people around me. It's about me being a part of preparing the way for the coming kingdom. I believe we're called to that. Which is why Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.15, Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Well, verse 7, so John's out there baptizing. People are coming out to him. And it tells us when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourself, We have Abraham for our father. I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. He's really laying into these guys. Now, I don't know if that's the best approach. I don't know if on a Sunday morning, if you all came in and sat down, and I looked at you and I said, I'd like to welcome you to the bridge this morning and tell you what a bunch of stinking snakes you really are. (laughs) And this is what John does. I mean, these are the most religious guys, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the guys who had at least on the surface devoted themselves to this this whole religion thing. And out they come with the rest of the people, oh, we're going to go do the baptism thing too. And John knew exactly what was on their hearts. For the Pharisees, it was all about pretense and posing. For the Sadducees, it was superficial swagger. They were just playing a role. They were playing church. And I love this about John. He just called him on it. We're not going to play church out here, John's saying. Don't come out here and pretend to repent. I've seen that. Well, I've done it. Maybe you have too. You've come forward on a Sunday morning. and you've, You've made a show of repentance. And the reality is nothing changes the next day. And that's why John says, if you're going to re- repent, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't let it be the words of the mouth. Let it be the action of the heart. And he goes after these guys. But what does this really mean to, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance? It simply means that the repentance is real, then real spiritual fruit will follow. If you're really giving your life back to the Lord, I don't need convincing, but it's going to show up in your life. There's no doubting it. If you say, I'm coming back to the Lord and I'm giving in my life, but nothing changes, it's a Pharisee move. It's a Sadducee superficiality. And James even said, faith that has no works is dead, being by itself. That's repenting without fruit. It's not saying that our works prove ourselves to God, our works buy our salvation, but he is saying our works do show what we really believe. You can say you believe something all you want. Show me. Show me the fruit. Now John deals with the fruit by going directly to the root. Verse 10. He says the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Why? Because if a tree is not bearing fruit, it's not going to bear fruit. It's not a fruit tree. If it's bearing thistles, it's gone. It's out of here. And he says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now for those of us who may have thought that that Jesus' ministry was a cuddly, soft, blanket acceptance of anyone doing anything with with no real call to a changed life, I think we need to learn something here. Jesus' very ministry was preceded by a severe Old Testament-style warning of judgment. That this Jesus who brought the season of grace to us is the same Jesus who will come in with severe and harsh judgment the second time around. We are blessed to live in the age of grace, my friends. We are blessed to have been born in history in this period. It is a time of grace. Because prior to this, it was judgment. And after this, judgment will return again on this Christ-rejecting and and sinful world. Now, there's an assumption made in some of these verses. And we're going to get to, by the way, we're going to get to barefoot with Jesus in the Galilee. But right now, we've got to keep our shoes on because we're on holy ground. Actually, I guess that means you take your shoes off. But we're in a serious place. 
I think there's been a misunderstanding applied to John's words here. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Maybe you've assumed that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire is one single event. It's one thing. And maybe you've thought that what John is saying is he's, he's drawing a, an allusion ahead to the day of Pentecost. When the tongues as of fire rested above the apostles' heads. So the Holy Spirit and fire, fire speaks of passion. That's not what John's saying here. And I believe I can make this clear. Jesus gives you two options. You can be baptized with the Holy Spirit or you can be baptized with fire. And fire speaks of judgment here. It does not speak of passion or power. Now there are other places where saying the baptism of the Holy Spirit is talked about and referred to as a passion power moment, as a wonderful thing, but that is not what John is talking about here. Why would you say that with such assurance, Rick? Well, if you look down at the end of the verse, he tells us he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So the context of what John is saying is, the one who comes after me has the, the ability to baptize you with his Holy Spirit, to immerse you, to soak you in his spirit, or to surround you with fire. Now why pause and talk about the judgment of Jesus at this point, before we're even into his life? Because we need to understand the reality that Jesus is God. That his love for us is absolute and eternal. That his judgment against sin is severe. This is not a different God as we get into the New Testament. He is one and the same God. And the standard of righteousness is just as high. And so we have two choices that John is portraying. Both the grace and judgment of Jesus. Be soaked in the Spirit now or be surrounded by fire then. Needless to say, John wasn't the most popular preacher. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people were coming out to him, but a lot of people were coming out in fear and trepidation. And especially those who saw him as a threat to their power. They did not like John at all. But we get to verse 13 now, and Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he permitted him. We talked about what that meant on Sunday. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, Sunday we learned the simple meaning of baptized. Baptizo, that Greek word, which literally means to immerse. But it's interesting to note the name John the Baptist. John the Baptizo. You know, if you're talking in the Greek. However, if you look at the Hebrew, it's also very telling. He's not John the Baptist because he is assigned to a particular denominational convention. That came after. He's John the Baptist because that word, again, in the Hebrew, his name is Yohanan Hamatbil. Yohanan Hamatbil. That is John who immerses. Hamatbil, or matbil in the Hebrew, means to submerge, to immerse. So now both in the Hebrew and the Greek, we see the meaning of the word is very clear. It's very simple. It's not John the one who sprinkles, or John the one who pours. It's John the one who immerses, Yohanan Hamatbil. He is there to speak of an immersion. The, the very name of John the Baptist reinforces God's intentions regarding baptism. It is an immersion both physically and spiritually. It's being soaked by the Spirit as you are soaked by water. And the soaking of the water is just a picture of the soaking of the living water, which God does, something even beyond us that we cannot do. Now again, John's baptism was different than the baptism of Jesus. In fact, those who came to faith in Christ later were always baptized into Christ. We have one scene in the book of Acts chapter 19 you can turn there I'll just read it to you Acts chapter 19 and verse 1 where Paul happens upon a group of people who had not been baptized into Jesus I want you to hear what happens here Acts chapter 19 verse 1 well it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples and he said to them, Do you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they said, No. They've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. 
And they said, well, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And this is interesting to me. For baptism into Jesus is far more significant because it portrays not only repentance, but as we talked about on Sunday, it portrays death to the natural man. The person who was baptized into John's baptism was just saying, I'm lousy and I admit it. The person baptized into Jesus is saying, I am ready to have the flesh torn away, to have the flesh washed off of me. I want to see my natural self die and I want to see new life for my spiritual man being soaked in the spirit of Christ Romans 13 14 Paul wrote put on the Lord Jesus Christ and listen make no provision for the flesh make no provision for the flesh what does that mean in your life what are the things that we do on a daily basis where we make provision for the flesh? For me, it's five pump vanilla breve lattes. I make provision for that in my flesh. My flesh love. And you know what? October, pumpkin spice. I love them. I'm making provision. That's my small provision for the flesh. But what, in what ways do we make provision for the flesh? That's Galen Chow's on a candy bar. That's perfect. <laughs> First John chapter 2, verse 15. And we're going to get into this quite a bit more on Sunday, but I want you to hear a bit of this now. John writes in a verse that should be familiar, hopefully, to some of you. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes... The boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Three things there. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Which speak to all three aspects of our being. Lust of the flesh, the physical. The lust of the eyes, which is the soul, the mental. And the boastful pride of life, which touches on the spiritual aspect of our pride. Now, that's kind of a general overview. We could be a whole lot more specific. When Paul says, make no provision for the flesh, gentlemen, let me ask you a question. When you compliment a woman who is not your wife on how she's looking that day, what does that do for you? What do you mean by that, Rick? I mean, what does that do for you? How does that make, gentlemen, guys, how does that make you feel when you see a woman who's not your wife and you say, Oof. She looks fine. Why would you go there? You're making provision for the flesh. And guys, I, I'm telling you, I, I think there's something in... I'm sorry, gentlemen, you're going to get picked on for a while here because th this is kind of something God's doing where he's opened my eyes to the need for us as men in the British Christian Fellowship to start stepping up. So I hope we don't start losing guys and just having a congregation full of women saying, Yes, preach on against the men. But... <laughs> But I are one, so that's why I'm talking about this. Gentlemen, there is something that happens in the heart of a man when he looks at a woman other than his wife and speaks out about her. You have no business doing that. Tell you what, guys, if you compliment any woman in your life, married men, compliment your wife and keep the compliments there. Because you don't need to go anywhere else. You're making provision for the flesh. If you are spending time alone with a woman who is not your wife. I mean, that's, that's one of the, the most foolish things any man can ever do. I don't care if it's a secretary. I don't care if it's someone who you just think is a friend. I don't think it's a woman who, you know, just understands me a little better than my wife does. It's absolutely stupid because it's making provision for the flesh. Well, I didn't do anything with her. I didn't touch her. I didn't kiss her. Obviously, I, I was not even... We were just talking and relating life. And there's an intimacy there again that is so dangerous. It's making provision for the flesh. Well, I can go on and on. But John says the world is passing away and also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Oh, Rick, you're starting to sound a little heavy-handed and legalistic. No, I'm not. These are things that free us. When I learn not to make provision for the flesh, 
and I learn to live and walk by the Spirit, guess what? I'm not carrying the weight and the burden of my sin nature anymore. And that is wonderful and it's joyful and it, and it brings a, a lifestyle that, that is far better. And by the way, it also increases the joy in my own marriage. When she's the only one who's getting my compliments. When she's the only one who's getting my winks and my looks and who's getting my time. My marriage is better for it. Romans chapter 6 verse 8. Paul says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer has master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Even so, Paul says, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And you might say, yeah, but Rick, I still sin. I know. Fight it. <laughs> Pray against it. Do everything you possibly can, men and women, to live in the Spirit, by the Spirit, and make no provision for the flesh. Paul says in Galatians 3.27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We are wearing Jesus now. Which is a far more precious thing than checking out what someone else may be wearing. If you've never experienced that soaking experience of baptism... Don't miss the power and poignancy of what the Hebrews call the matbil, being immersed into Jesus. And if you have, start considering yourselves dead to sin. Far too many Christians are just wallowing in their sin life. I'm just such a sinner. Hey, you died to sin. Now live for Christ. And let the old man, let the old woman die away. Verse 16, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God. Descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus' baptism, we, we again looked at it Sunday, but there's something here that I, that I had missed, I'd never seen, and, and I, I credit John Corson for pointing this out. This is fascinating to me. Jesus' baptism hinted at something that happened long, long ago. Thousands of years before Jesus came on the scene. We see Jesus anointed in his baptism as our great high priest, but that's not what I'm talking about. We see in this moment the Trinity, which is fantastic. That's not what I'm talking about. What we see here in Jesus' baptism is, think about this, a man standing in, surrounded by water, as a dove comes to him. Does that ring a bell for you? Noah. Noah. Okay, Rick, so Noah. Yeah, Noah standing on the ark, surrounded completely by water. During the rain, probably completely immersed in water as the rain was coming down and the floods were coming up. The whole thing was water everywhere. But now this man Noah is standing on the ark and sends out the dove and the dove returns to him and he reaches out, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 8, he reaches out and he receives the dove to himself. And here Jesus comes up out of the water and the dove lights on him. And you might say, well... That's interesting, but I think you're kind of stretching your analogies a little bit. Well, if I am, so is Peter, because Peter is the one in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, who compares baptism to Noah and the flood. And it makes a very clear connection. But there's another man, another prophet of old, who found himself surrounded by water. And what's interesting is this man who was surrounded by water, his very name means dove. And it's the man whose name in the Hebrew is Jonah. We call him Jonah. So there was Noah, surrounded by water. The dove comes to him. It's Jonah, dove, who is completely submerged by water. In fact, so much so that he's in the belly of a fish until the fish irked him up on the beach at Assyria, which must have been just disgusting. We won't get into that right now. but ugh. You know both stories, but think about this now. Noah's baptism, Noah's baptism saved him from the drowning world around him. So does ours. Jonah's baptism was about drowning out the natural man within him. It wasn't about the outside world. It was about his problems that God took him into the, into the water. And so both have impact on us. Both are like us. That we are saved from the drowning world. We are saved. We are drowning out, killing off as it were the old man, the old woman within us. But while both of these portray certain aspects of baptism, that is dying to the world and dying to self... 
both of these two men fail after their baptismal experience. Noah, one of the eight people saved, one of the, the man who God called, who His grace shone upon, called him righteous. Noah ends up toward the end of his story, drunk out of his mind and naked in his tent. Not a very nice picture of righteousness. This was after he had had this amazing experience of preaching as a prophet for all those years and, and, and being saved through the flood and watching God's tremendous judgment. He still goes out, plants a vineyard, gets drunk, and ends up stark raving naked in his tent. Jonah, well that's great, Jonah's story ends up with him. The, the book of Jonah ends with him sitting under a tamarisk tree, sulking and whining and complaining. Why would he do that? Because the people of Nineveh didn't hear his message? No, because they did. Because they heard his message and they repented. And he goes off and sulks. Well, I don't understand why those heathen got to get saved. He says, my salvation was just for the Jews and just for us. And they're not getting saved. It's not fair, Lord. I just don't like this at all. And I look at those two men and I think, wow. Can you relate to them? I mean, like Noah, there are old sins that should have been drowned at my baptism years ago. And then they resurface. Oh. I thought I was done with that one. Uh, do I have to get baptized again? And then there's Jonah. Like Jonah, though we're called to seek the lost and to love unchristian, non-Christian people, how often do we look at them like Jonah looked at the people of Nineveh and just go, frankly, I'm kind of glad they're not in this church. Kind of glad they're not saved. You know? They deserve what they're going to get. I mean, you might not say that out loud, but do you ever just kind of have that attitude where... I mean, to be honest, there are days I think I would love just to hang out with Bridge Christian Fellowship people and nobody else. If everybody else just kind of disappeared, that'd be okay. Just us. We're cool, you know? And in both situations, I'm thinking we give our lives to Christ, we get baptized, we have this fantastic spiritual experience, and then something comes up, bubbles to the surface, we have an attitude, a mentality, we have an action, a sin that's so bad and so wrong, and we, and we start to wonder, maybe my baptism just didn't take. Maybe it just didn't work like it was supposed to. I actually knew a young man when I was growing up who had the habit of getting baptized a lot because he thought, every time I mess up, i got to go back and get washed again. I mean, he should have moved out to Quamran and been one of the Essenes, and he could have done it four or five times a day. Well, there's another connection, gang, between Noah, Jonah, and Jesus. All three of these men encountered 40 days of trial at the time of their baptism. Again, so-called baptism for Noah and Jonah. For Noah, it was 40 days of flooding rain. For Jonah, it was 40 days of preaching about Nineveh's destruction. And for Jesus, as we see in chapter 4 before us, it's going to be 40 days in the wilderness. What's the point? Simply this. Of the three men, only one was victorious. Of the three men, only one never failed. Only one completely overcame. So what? So that's the power of Jesus' death and our baptism into his death. Our baptism is about getting ourselves clean and then hanging on to our own cleanliness. Our baptism is a baptism into the death of Jesus Christ who overcame the sinless one who is completely spotless so that now his blood covers me. I am connected to the perfect baptism in Jesus. Baptism is not just about dying to the world or dying to myself. It's about dying with Jesus, who is the victorious one. Which is why Paul says in Romans 6.3, Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death? No wonder he said to John, Right now, it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Because my baptism is a picture. My death is the answer. And when people afterwards are baptized, they're going to be baptized into me. And he is capable of maintaining that perfection. Even though we don't. Even though we sin. Even though we fail. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so Jesus, being fully righteous, fulfilled all righteousness. Now watch this. Immediately after his baptism, something happens. The Holy Spirit rests upon Jesus. Immediately afterwards, the Spirit descends as a dove and lights on him. The, the Lord speaks out, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
And that's what the promise is, that you receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is not for a select few. This is for everybody. The promise is to all people. Peter said, both to you who are here and to those who are far off, which is us, that you repent and you're baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has the Spirit come upon him, and what did he do? What was the first thing that happened when the Spirit anointed Jesus? Did he start performing miracles? Did he at this point all of a sudden raise someone from the dead or heal the sick? Did he begin speaking in tongues or prophesying or doing some marvelous, miraculous thing? No. The very first thing that happened when the Spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism, verse 1 of chapter 4, Jesus was led. He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mark goes so far as to put it this way. He knows that the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. The word in the, uh, I believe it's in the New American Standard, is impelled, which is to to push. The Spirit comes on him, oh, like a dove, and just goes, get out, go, into the wilderness with you, come on, let's move. And Jesus finds himself in, in the wilderness being tempted for 40 days. That was the first thing that happened when the Spirit came upon Jesus. Now listen, I completely believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. I believe they are available to us. I believe the Spirit gives to each one just as He wills, that they are active and alive. Both the the quiet, more humble type gifts and the power gifts, I believe, are all available. I don't believe there's anything in Scripture that shows us that those had to stop. However, that being said, the presence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life is not proved by the gifts. It is not proved by the phenomena, the excitement, or the enthusiasm. The presence of God's Holy Spirit in your life is seen as we go where the Spirit goes. As Jesus, immediately we know the Spirit is with him. Why? Because he is led by the Spirit. He's going where the Lord says to go. He's doing what the Lord says to do. And Jesus would say in John chapter 3, verse 8, The wind blows wherever it wishes... And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. How do I know if I'm Spirit-led? Well, are you doing what the Lord's telling you to do? How do I know if I'm Spirit-filled? Are you following His leading in your life? Paul said in Romans 8.14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And to be filled with and led by the Spirit of Christ, gang, it's to recognize I'm no longer my own man. My choices, my decisions, my actions, they're not mine to make. They're God's to make. And as Penelope uh, said just the other day, she said, you know, we've got to pray before we go to Ai. Maybe you remember that story after the great battle of Jericho in the book of Joshua. Joshua and the people look up there. There's a little town, Ai, about 3,000 men. No big deal. They dispatch a good size of the army to go out and just take them out, and they lose Because they never prayed. They never sought the Lord to say, should we go do this? Is this what you want for us? The Spirit-led person always begins our actions by saying, Lord, what would you have me do? And when he tells us, even if it's something that's freaking us out, okay, that's what you want, Lord. Well, Jesus is compelled into a time of great testing as the Lord, by His Spirit, leads him into the wilderness. Verse 2 tells us, After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you want to note this, that's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Verse 5, Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands He will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is also written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6.16 
Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give you if you will fall down and worship me. Well then Jesus said, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy 6, 13. I wonder what book Jesus had been studying at the time of the temptation of Satan. Surprise, surprise. He was probably in the scroll of Deuteronomy. Well, Jesus knew the whole word. He could have quoted anything. Yeah, but he's quoting this three times. I'm thinking this is where his meditation is right now. It tells us, verse 11, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. This story about the temptation of Jesus is a challenging one to us. And it raises the question I've heard many times. Since Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, does that mean that Jesus was temptable? Does that further mean that it's conceivable that Jesus, had he chosen to, that Jesus, being God and man, could have sinned? I'll tell you about that on Sunday. We're going to go on tonight and save that one, spend some time in it. But suffice it to say for now that Jesus proved his worth as the only sinless man who could carry the sins of mankind. The word tempt here is to prove. He was driven out by the Spirit into the wilderness to be proven. And he was. And he passed the test with flying colors. Verse 12. Now, <clears throat> kick off your shoes and get ready to walk in the grass of the Galilee. When Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Jesus withdrew, the Bible tells us, into Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, the Bible tells us. Now, Nazareth, if you look at it on a map, and you probably have a Bible map that you can check on this, but Nazareth is in the southwest corner of the region of the Galilee. It's barely in the Galilee. It's up on a mountain looking down over the valley of Megiddo, and that was Jesus' hometown. And it tells us he, he goes from Nazareth, and he withdraws into Galilee and ends up in Capernaum. Capernaum is smack dab in the middle of the Galilee. It's a seaside fishing town right on that coastal side of Lake Gennesaret or as we call it, the Sea of Galilee. This place, Galilee of the Gentiles, as it was known. In Hebrew, it would be Galil Goyim. Galil being Galilee, Goyim, the word for Gentiles, literally it means the district or the circuit of the non-Jews. I don't know if you've heard this before, but Jews today will call a non-Jew a Goy, and it's kind of a Jewish cuss word. It's a slang, it's a put-down. So if you ever have a Jewish friend who looks at you and just goes, ah, oh, you're such a goy, and then they move on, and you go, oh, hey, he was speaking Hebrew. That's kind of cool. No, he just puts you down. <laughs> this is Galil of the Goy. The district or the circuit, that's all Galilee means, is the circuit, the place, the, the, the area of the Gentiles. Because at this time, even though this region was originally the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, by this time, due to Roman occupation, it was mostly Gentiles. They had kind of flooded in. They liked it there. It's a beautiful area. Like I said, green grass, rolling hills. The Sea of Galilee is a huge... It's a lake, but it's a massive lake that looks somewhat like a sea. But with all that Gentile occupation gang, it was also known to be pretty dark and wicked in that region. In the Galilee, Jesus began to make his ministry circuit, his ministry Galil. He would go between three primary towns. You'll see him again and again in one of these three places, either Capernaum by the sea, or Chorazin, or Bethsaida. But in all of this, Matthew doesn't tell us why Jesus made Capernaum instead of Nazareth his headquarters. Later on, we'll find that out from Luke when we learn that the people of his own hometown in Nazareth rejected him. And so being in Nazareth and being rejected by his people, literally they tried to push him off the cliff and kill him, off of what today is called Mount Precipice. After all that happened, Jesus withdrew and ended up in Capernaum and started his ministry there. Now, if, if that was all we knew about it, we'd say, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, he's rejected here, so try again over here. He planted a church there, it fell apart, so he went over here. Oh, we understand that. Okay. But there's so much more going on here that Matthew does tell us about that the rejection of the Jews of Nazareth would ultimately mean the salvation of the Gentiles in the region of the Galilee. Verse 14. 
This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. The prophetic significance here is huge. What Satan meant for evil, that is to try and get Jesus killed. Stirring up the people of Nazareth. Hate him. He, who does he think he is? Trying to push him off that cliff. Satan's like, oh, this, this could be his God. And he walked right through him. How did he do that? <laughs> I just love that scene. Luke chapter 4, I believe it is, where Jesus just gets out to the end of the cliff. They're about to push him off. And the Bible said he just walked right through him and went on his way. That's amazing. So it didn't happen the way Satan meant for it to happen. He thought he would cause all kinds of problems. Every time Satan means something for evil, God means it for good. And so Jesus leaves there, sets up in Capernaum exactly where prophetic scripture said he would. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali. The land where there was a great darkness. It was dark in Gentile land. They didn't have the Lord. They didn't have that understanding of God. And in this dark place, it was the perfect place, the perfect region to switch on the light, the great light, who is, in fact, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. At this point, Jerusalem was a city filled with religious people who had no idea they were lost. But the people in the Galil, oh, they knew they were lost. They knew their lives were messed up. And they needed a Savior desperately. When Jesus was in Jewish territory, he was perfectly poised to sow this message of the kingdom. But gang, it was so much more than that, because as Jesus sowed the message of the kingdom, those seeds began to sprinkle out and to get in and among the hearts and the soil of the Gentiles. And what was that message? Verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He picks up right from where John left off. John's now in prison. But the message doesn't stop. And that should remind us, by the way, that just because a certain individual is no longer bringing the message, the message doesn't stop. I've been asked a couple of times, Rick, what what do we do at the bridge if if you get hit by a car and die? And I say, first of all, why are you even fantasizing about that? (laughs) And secondly, I'll tell you what would happen. The message goes on. Because the message has nothing to do here with the individual, especially here. In the case of John the Baptist, he is put into prison. Herod thinks, good, I've got him shut up. And then all of a sudden Jesus is saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message is continuing on. It's the message of the gospel, the message of the kingdom. But it's no longer the emissary bringing the news. It is now the king himself. By the way, The rejection of Jesus in Nazareth, leading to his ministry in the Galil of the Goyim, is a snapshot, a small little microcosm of the bigger picture. And that is what Paul tells us in Romans 11.11. He says, I say the Jewish people, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, or you could say by their rejection of Christ, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Because Jerusalem wouldn't have him, because Nazareth wouldn't have him, guess what? He goes to Galil of the Gentiles. And the same thing happens in the big picture of the world, that that by the transgression of the Jewish people, salvation now goes to the Gentiles to make the Jewish people jealous. Now if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, you and me, how much more will their fulfillment be when their jealousy ultimately leads them to return to Jesus? And the whole circle is complete. Verse 18. Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus is now beginning his public ministry. He's beginning that the message repent, the kingdom's at hand. But now he's not going to do it without a support staff. Even Jesus himself surrounded himself with disciples. Now, you may know this, but that was typical of rabbis in the day. 
If a rabbi came of age and was well studied and worth following, he would begin to select disciples to follow him that he would take and would be like a moving school. Wherever he went, his school of followers, 10, 15, 20 guys, whatever, would follow. They'd sit at his feet. He'd unroll Torah scrolls. He would teach them and explain things to him. And so this is a very typical thing for a rabbi to do. But it was a very atypical thing, first of all, because it was a carpenter, and secondly, because of the people that he chose. These were not students fresh out of cemetery, seminary. <laughs> These were students of fishing and of tax collecting. One was Simon the Zealot, who was absolutely anti the tax collectors, and Matthew, who was a tax collector, all in the same class. Bad idea. <laughs> Judas, who would betray him. These guys are a bunch of unlearned slaves. Not a single one of them would ultimately stand by Jesus at the crucifixion. They'd run away, scared out of their minds. They'd hide out for three days in the upper room going, what are we going to do? I guess it wasn't true. Even after seeing all the things that he had done. He calls Peter a loudmouth fisherman first. And Jesus knew. He had to have heard Peter spouting off about this or that. He calls his brother Andrew. Then he calls James and John, two brothers with anger issues, wanting to call down thunder and lightning on whoever they can. And then these other guys, and he's calling them. If you were, if you were a, a, a thinking Jew in the day, watching Jesus do this from the side, you'd be going, this is just weird. This is just, I tell you what, I wouldn't call guys like that to be shepherds of this church. Of course, I guess in a lot of ways, our shepherds are kind of like that, but that's another, <laughs> another conversation for another time. But you know something else you've got to recognize about these men that Jesus was calling? It didn't happen instantaneously. It's, uh, it's not misleading, but it's interesting. With, with Matthew, he's, he's moving on, he's showing us some stuff, and he's, he's getting to other things. But we read Matthew, and we get the sense that all Jesus did was say, Hey, Peter, Andrew, want to follow me? Cool, let's do it. And off they go. That's not the way it happened. And we know that because we can look at the different perspective of all the Gospels. What happened? Well, he called them the first time in Jerusalem. Before this, John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, and you can read that story. He called these guys. Well, here they are, back fishing. So he calls them again, here in Matthew chapter uh, 4, verses 18 through 21. A second calling. Oh, good, okay, well, immediately we see, yeah, they left their nets, their fathers, their work, and they followed him. But he's going to have to call them again because the next thing we know, they're back out fishing again. They're not getting it. But he wants them to be with him. The third time is Luke chapter 5, where finally Peter has a miraculous catch of fish and recognizes the power of Jesus and falls on his face and says, Go away from me, I'm a sinner. I know this is the third time you called me, but you know what? I, I, I just assumed you were kidding the first two times. You know? It took him that much time to come around. And I'm so thankful for his patience. I'm so thankful that the way the Lord chooses to work in your life and my life is over time. I'm so thankful that none of us, when he first called us, none of us snapped to. Not a one of us came to and, and found our, our spiritual greatness. In fact, most of us aren't even sure what spiritual greatness is. We haven't even gotten there yet. But God is so patient. And he calls, and we go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be right there. And we get back busy, and he calls again. Oh, okay, yeah, right there. It's perfect. Good day for it. I'll, I'll do it, Lord. And he calls again, and he just kind of keeps calling. Sometimes, though, the rabbi's call is immediate. The, the disciple's response takes some time. And Paul says, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And when I think about how patient God is with me, it has a lot to say about my patience with other believers. There are great differences between us, gang. There are some of us who have been walking with Jesus 10 minutes, and others who have been walking with Him 10, 15, 20, 30 years. But you know what? The disciple who has been walking with Jesus for 30 years is no greater in the eyes of the Lord than the disciple who just turned around and accepted the call the first time who's just about to go out fishing again. God looks at us all and says, I love my disciples. I love my followers, and I am patiently working with each and every single one. 
In our flesh, we have a tendency to cast out people too quickly. People that the Lord is looking at and going, I know they sinned. I know they blew it. But I'm still working with them. How about you cut them some slack as well? Paul said in Ephesians 4, verse 1, Walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One sister just said yesterday, Every morning I wake up, I have a fresh start with God, so I might as well give the same to someone else. I love that. Well said. So if you're on a cross, a brother or sister in Christ who is trying your patience, and if you haven't, you will, ask the Lord to see them with his eyes. Ask the Lord to give you the same patience toward them that he has to you. And Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Now what's great about Peter, Andrew, James, and John is these guys are diamonds in the rough. These guys would go on to be the, the pillars, the foundation stones on top of, of course, Jesus, the main foundation of the church. They would all lose their lives to martyrdom with the possible exception of John, although they tried to kill him. These would be some wonderful, amazing men once they finally embrace the call. And when they do embrace that call, they leave everything. Ultimately, their nets, their boats, their families, everything, they leave it behind. How many of us have gone that far? And yet, why not? Why not leave everything for Jesus? He said, don't worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll meet your needs. Whether you're heading back to Russia or whatever you're doing, I'll take care of it. You seek the kingdom. I mean, this, I really think this is a deal that God is putting out there for us. I tell you what, if you seek the kingdom, I'll meet all your needs. What do you think? Want to shake on it? And we go, boy, you know what? That's great. That's really cool. Um, let me pray about that. <laughs> you know, we'll worship through it a little bit. Because I'm right with you, Lord. That's, that's good stuff. You know? Man, I challenge you guys. What, what would happen if, if this entire church, if we took his hand? Okay, you got it. I'm going to start from this day forward doing nothing but seeking the kingdom. And you provide for me. You make it happen, Lord. You pay the rent. How many of you like paying the rent or the mortgage? <laughs> I don't like it. I hate writing that check. So let God do it. Let him write the check. Let him cover the bills. Let him worry about the day-to-day -day stuff. You focus on the kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Boy, that's taking it awfully literally. Well, yeah, again, why not? Jesus said it. Do we believe him or not? By the way, did you see what uh, Peter was doing when Jesus called him? He was casting nets. And Jesus would go on to make him a great fisher of men. You notice what, what John was doing when Jesus called him? He was mending nets. And we know historically that John would go on to be known as the Apostle of Love, who was about writing letters that were all about mending the church and spurring people in the church on to love each other. And I just point that out because the Lord has a way of turning the natural into the supernatural by His grace for His glory. A lot of times that's exactly what God will do. He'll take something that's a natural propensity of yours, and when you give it to Him, He will put a supernatural thing on it where now all of a sudden, wow, there's something going on here that's far more than I could ever do. Far more than my natural man can do. Jesus never said to these apostles, He didn't say, okay, I'm calling you, but I want you to go spend some time in seminary. He didn't say, take a course on evangelism and then let me know when you finish. He, he didn't say, brush up on your Hebrew and Greek. He just said two words, follow me. Just follow me. What you're doing right now is exactly the kind of training that Jesus would have for you. Just, you just come be with me. Hear my voice, watch what I do, and go do the same thing. That is so simple. And when we follow Jesus, the natural, that's where it gets altered into the supernatural. That's where he begins to do his work. Well, verse 23, 
Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Verse 24 tells us the news about him spread throughout all Syria. Syria is north of Israel. And they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. All of them. By the way, Jesus didn't come to the earth to heal, but he just couldn't help it. That's just his nature. He was just doing what naturally Jesus did. He came to bring the gospel of the kingdom. He came to seek and save the lost. The healing was just a natural result of people being around Jesus. And large crowds, verse 25, followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond Jordan. And we can see here how quickly the seed of Jesus the Word is spreading out. It's getting sprinkled. It's now getting up into Syria. It's getting across the Jordan into the region of the Decapolis. The, the Decapolis, which, by the way, there's a city you can visit called Scythopolis or Bet-Shan. And Bet-Shan in Israel is one of the, it's the largest uh, archaeological find in all of Israel. And it was one of the ten cities, Decapolis, ten cities, that Jesus visited. And you can see that if you sign up for the Israel trip and come with us next March. <laughs> but this message is spreading. And uh, Les mentioned a verse that caught my ears this morning. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. And delivered them from their destructions. Now what's great about that verse, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it was intended as a prophetic verse speaking of Jesus, but it totally works. He sent his word, the word made flesh. Who is Jesus? He sent his word and healed them. And that's what the word does. Whether it was Christ in the flesh, the word we have before us, or the Holy Spirit speaking God's word into your heart, into your life, the word heals. And God sends his word into us. And it is a healing word. Well, as we've gone through tonight, I hope you've seen and caught all of this preparation that's been going on. All this laying in foundation and getting things ready. God is always about that. The prophets of old prepared the pages of Scripture. John the Baptist prepared the path. Jesus' baptism prepared his priestly ministry. The Lord prepared the place, that is Galilee of the Gentiles, that dark place, perfect place to flip on the light. And Jesus prepared the people, both his disciples and all those in the surrounding regions. He prepared them with the gospel of the kingdom. And now with everything set to go, everything laid in, it is time for the public ministry to take off. Chapter 5 begins the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll get to next Wednesday night. But the focus on all this preparation, let me leave you with this thought. Jesus never is caught unprepared. You will never catch him by surprise. He is always ready for every eventuality. And even tonight, as we sit here pouring over his preparations to his kingdom message and his ministry, even tonight, Jesus is still preparing. John 14, verse 2, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. Father, we look forward to being in that place prepared. As Keith Green once sang, In six days you created the whole world, but you've been working on heaven 2,000 years. Wow. And Jesus, I can't even tell you how much it means to us, your sometimes disciples, sometimes fishing people, sometimes wandering out into our own lives and kind of forgetting it. I cannot tell you what it means to us, Lord, to know that you think about us so constantly that you are in the, the act of preparing the place to bring us. And so, Jesus, I just I ask tonight that as you prepare the place for us, would you use us, like John the Baptist, use us as people who are preparing the way of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.